Welcome back. This is How Did I Get Here, the show, of course, where we're asking the question, how did you get here? I'm quite excited about today's guest, mainly because I'm a Freo fan that grew up in the 2000s. Matt Pavlich is my guest today. Matt, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Uh, so let's jump right into it. So you're born in Adelaide, early 80s. At the time, you know, AFL isn't a national competition, but the mm-hmm. Sandfall obviously is huge. Crows come into the competition when you're about 10, mm-hmm. uh, Port later on. What's footy culture like in South Australia back in the 80s? Oh, back in the 80s, it was uh, it was very much still looking at the SANFL um, as you know, pretty much the elite competition, mm-hmm. along with the VFL and the Waffle. Um, but it was very sort of tribal and suburban. Um, that's the way I remember it. And I, I had the great fortune um, of um, having my dad play in the SNFL and his two brothers play in the SNFL. And so I guess footy was always um, a part of my life. I, I certainly never felt pressured to play football, um, but it kind of felt yeah, ever present. Um, m- mum and dad always used to say that there was always a ball around the house or outside. Um, and so whether that was a tennis ball, a cricket ball, a soccer ball, a football, you know, sport was just such a big part of my life growing up. So I tried pretty hard at school. I, I, I feel as though I always, um, I always wanted to do my best and didn't always succeed at <laughs> doing that, but I always really wanted to try my best. So... You know, relatively earnest or, or disciplined with you know, my school and, and tried pretty hard. I was certainly never the brightest kid at school, but I wanted to do well. And I think I applied that with most of the things I've done in my life. I, I want to do well and I want to su- try to succeed. Um, now, as I said, didn't always work out that way. <laughs> had lots of failures and, and missteps along the journey. But school was great, but sport and you know, the, the backyard, the front yard, the schoolyard uh, was where I was able to show... I guess, my true wares uh, on the sporting field. Mm. You mentioned there, of course, your dad and two uncles were Sandville players for West mm. Torrens, which is a huge footy club down in Adelaide. Uh, did you spend much time at the club as a kid? Yeah, yeah, I did. And a smile sort of comes straight away to my <laughs> face because um, I've got the... So dad played uh, in the... Uh, he, he started as a 16-year-old, really mm. quite young. He, he had a dream of playing with Port Adelaide, um, but my grandparents lived basically a 60 metre torp from uh, from Port Adelaide uh, zone and so he was a West Torrens player and he got invited down really early on um, and, and you know, was fortunate to play. He got injured a lot, um, including a pretty significant car accident that he and mum were in mm. and not long after they were, or just before they were married in the early 70s and... Um, and that sort of cost him a couple of years. It almost cost mum her life. Right. Um, fortunately, it didn't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think they probably wore a few scars, both physically and mentally, from that. But his career was uh, fits and starts, you know, sort of a long time. And then when I was born, he was transitioning into uh, coaching, uh, which was which meant that a lot of my childhood was spent in around Theberton Oval, uh, West Torrens Footy Club, and that was in the change rooms. That was you know at the club rooms. I've got these memories of you know being on dad's shoulders, you know, at, at the after match presentations and uh, you know, both teams being there. The old school kind of thing that happened in the eighties. Um, unfortunately doesn't happen so much now. Um, probably probably a little bit with the waffle and but certainly not in the AFL. Um, and so yeah, I was always around a football club, a football club environment and, and that certainly helped me, you know, later down the track about respecting people that volunteered their time, respecting the fans, respecting the members, and really that that sense of a club and a, and another home to go to. Um, I, I had that, you know, as a as a two year old, a three year old, sort of running around at West Torrens. Yeah, uh, you went to high school, Sacred Heart College in Adelaide, which is a kind of footy factory in its own right. Yeah. Uh, what was that experience like? Is footy culture big there? Look, it was, yeah, it certainly was. I, but I'd say sport. Sport, mm. sport again, was, um, you know, netball. So it was a bit of a weird mix, uh, Sacred Heart. You go, the middle school's six to nine, and the girls and boys both split yeah. between you six and nine, and they come together co-ed right. 10 to 12. Uh, I loved, actually, probably, I didn't necessarily, um, year seven, I left my primary school, went into year eight. Obviously, it's changed a bit now. Um those two years at Sacred Heart, the middle school, I, I don't know, I sort of, sport was the only way I really fit in, frankly. I, oh. I didn't necessarily feel, 
you know, because guys had established their relationships and friendships in year six and seven. I sort of came as the fresh year eight guy. And I, I kind of, I remember the first term not feeling, well, not belonging or being really accepted by um, my new friends or new classmates until I was able to, you know, make some runs and take some wickets on the <laughs> on the cricket field early in the eight days uh, summer. And then, you know, all of a sudden you start to, to meet a few, few guys and, and have those relationships with. So... Again, sport was a, a real um, – I, I kind of needed that a little bit to, to build relationships uh, and, and you, sometimes your own aspirations um, had to meet with some of the other guys and you start to form those bonds. So um, sport was a big thing. Cricket, netball for the girls. Uh, once they got to, to – once we came together in year 10, that was a big thing. Um, basketball was quite a big sport yeah. uh, at the school. Um, but you're right, footy was probably the, the preeminent – one that everyone focused on, and it's been very successful for a long time in the in the school system. There, winning state championships and and so on, um, as well as producing lots of SNFL and AFL players. So it was big. But um, I mean, the, the thing I take out of school is the fact that I my best mates now. Like I'm forty, right? Yeah. Almost forty one. My best mates are still the guys I went through uh, high school with. Right. Yeah. Um, three or four, you know, five guys. So I've met lots of great people and I've got lots of great friends from my time here in Western Australia and, and you know, from university and everything else. But, you know, if I think about my core group of mates, they're still the, the three or four or five guys that I went to school with. How would you describe yourself as a student? As I said before, not um, certainly not an A-grade student, <laughs> someone who tried pretty hard in the classroom. I, um, I think I was pretty... I, I, yeah, I think I added to the classroom. I tried to, um, you know, give give more than I, I probably um, could, if that made sense. Um, I, I, I did well enough in year, year 12 to get to university and get to the courses I wanted to. Um, I was probably a bit distracted in hindsight, uh, like, like most kids, um, particularly in their last year, on the basis that I was most likely going to be drafted into the AFL. Mm. Um, but no, look, I, I mean, I, I loved, um, I, I didn't really like, uh, I, I enjoyed science, I enjoyed uh, geography, I enjoyed English. Um, they were probably the ones that I, uh, legal studies I remember doing in year 12, which was a subject I really, really enjoyed that. So, um, but I'd always, you know, I was doing sort of more biology and human movement type of stuff or, or that, and, and that was what I was hoping to get into. Um, and then that was an interesting transition because it was like, well, I'll, I'll apply to the Adelaide universities and, and hopefully get into a sports psych or, or human movement type of degree. Um, and then, you know, subsequently, end of year, nine, uh, end of year 12 was, uh, was drafted. section we do here on How Did I Get Here is just some rapid-fire questions about yep. your life as a student. So first thing that comes to your mind, what did you want to be when you grew up? An AFL player. An AFL player, yep. Or, <laughs> tick. Yeah, tick. Or um, like involved in sports administration Yeah. if if, uh, if the footy career wasn't going to come off. Fair enough. Favourite subject? Our PE, but probably, yeah. Uh, yeah, like human biology was probably mm. the next one. Yeah. What about least favourite subject? Uh, some of the like some of the really tough maths and physics things weren't mm. necessarily my, my jam. Um, yeah, I'd probably go there. Now, I know you played footy and cricket. Any other sports? Oh, I played, yeah, um, basketball, golf. Te- I didn't play a huge amount of tennis, a little bit of tennis. Um, athletics, you know, I, I was one of those guys that was just keen to kind of play sports. So yeah. if your mates were doing it, I was kind of doing it. Um, but yeah, footy and cricket were the main two. Mm. Uh, were you a teacher's pet or a troublemaker? Somewhere in between, Somewhere in between I think. Yeah. I, I definitely wasn't the teacher's pet. <laughs> um but I wasn't like I wasn't a class clown either. I think you know I kind of tried to read the play a little bit on that one. Did you have a, a job before you started out? Yeah. Of footy? What was your first job? Yeah, so uh, I worked in an ice cream parlour <laughs> um, down at, at England Elk on Jetty Road. Um, <laughs> so I was scooping uh, scooping ice cream and and making waffles as a part of my first job. So I did that in year. Just trying to think, years probably nine, ten, and eleven, perhaps, or, or certainly yeah, ten and eleven, yeah. Ice cream. Did not expect that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the after, Danish nougat was my favourite. Danish nougat. Yeah, oh, yeah. Take, that, take that one. Uh, so you play for a year in the Sandful at mm. Woodville West Torrens, the same club your dad and uncles played for. How did it feel to be at the same club? You know, that there's family connection. Oh, it was enormous. Like to see um, 
the name Pav- Pavlich up in the lockers mm. and your dad and, and your uncles. That was that was very cool. And I think, I mean, by that stage, the club had amalgamated with, wood, with Woodville. Mm. So the change rooms were at Woodville Oval now um, and the home ground was at Woodville. But um, credit to the people that um, amalgamated because they did a really nice job of, um, I think anyway, this is my opinion, I'm not sure if it's held with everyone, but they did a really nice job of, recognising the past of West Torrens mm. and Woodville. Um, West Torrens had been in there longer, that had more success, and so there was a, a really nice recognition, which included things like, you know, the name of the locker and all those things. So to walk in and, and kind of see that and feel that was was really nice. And as always, the older people that Dad and my uncles um, sort of worked with, for want of a better term, or some of the volunteers and, and support staff were still there when I was going through, you know, um, yeah. and the fans and all that. So... Special memory. Yeah. Uh, any highlights from that year in the Sandful? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, my, my first game and the fact that we uh, – it's a highlight slash low light is getting uh, – we lost by a goal in the uh, preliminary final. So oh, as a 17-year-old yeah. to play kind of a whole season in year 12, which was a bit controversial at the time because um, Sagra Hart were – they were forthcoming, fortunately – Given the fact that I played two years of first day in footy prior to that, but um, but yeah, as a seventeen year old, and I got to play with you know in nineteen ninety eight in year eleven, I was fortunate to play in an under nineteens premiership. So mm. a lot of those guys um, eventually the next year went on to play you know reserves and league football, which you got to share that experience with. There's a really young group of players coming through together, uh, and a lot of those guys ended up getting drafted around the same time. Um, for for footy fans out there. These names may or may not um, remember, but Rhett Biglands and Justin Sicilella, uh, Andrew Crow, Ken McGregor, Brett Burton, uh, Rob Shirley. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of a lot of them went to Adelaide actually at the, at the Crows, but uh, Matthew Whelan went to Melbourne, um, and so I had this great experience of you know all these young guys that I'd sort of grown up with, playing footy with, had, having success with, play in a in a, uh, a league year, do really really well with some older players supporting us. Uh, but yeah, uh, unfortunately, falling over just at the uh, the second last hurdle. Mm. Mentioned the draft there, so nineteen ninety nine draft. You're taking a pick four. What's draft night like for you? Is it a bit well, of it pressure? It was draft day back draft then. Draft day, it was, uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, it was televised on Channel Seven back in the day. Um, uh, what was it like? Oh, it was it was emotional. It was exciting. It was flattening. It was kind of weird because. You know, you, you go through these, all these emotions. I think leading in, I knew that um, I was going to be taken within the first handful of picks. Yeah. At that stage, those first handful of picks included moving to Melbourne or, or moving to Perth, basically, was were the two options. Mm-hmm. And when Collingwood and, and Richmond didn't pick me up in the, with their first couple of picks, it was like, well, I feel like I'm definitely going to Frio. Um, which, so, yeah. On one hand, I'm like, this is the most exciting, awesome day of my life and it's also the most sort of gut-wrenching, you know, emotional day because I was about to pack up the bags and, and leave the family. So, And I had a, a bunch of mates there as well from school and, and some family friends. So, look, it was, um, it was good and bad in, in many senses. And I've said this before, but, you know, um, heading to Frio at the time was kind of my worst nightmare, yeah. frankly. Um, but... Um, that quickly changes the more I invested myself and, and, you know, the club washed over me when I got to Perth. That's kind of my next question is, you know, Frio is a four-year-old, five-year-old club at this point. They've never made a final. What's the actual environment like in Frio in those early days? Well, it was probably laughable. And yeah. I, I, don't, I don't say that disrespectfully no, because, yeah. you know, I, I've always been um, thoughtful of the people that went before us. But... It, it didn't have a club, it was nomadic. So, you know, we were training at South Fremantle Oval and our change rooms were South Fremantle's away change rooms. So waffle standard away change rooms mm. were where we would change. Um, we'd, we would meet, um, lift and have our physio all in the old, underneath the old grandstand at Fremantle over there. So pe- people that know Freo over well will know the old grandstand there. There's a gym there now and South Fremantle have their, have their club rooms there or, or administration there. That was basically our gym, our meeting room and our physio, mm. um, all in the one sort of tiny, cold, um, decrepit place. We would train at Subiaco sometimes. We'd train at Aquinas College. We'd train at 
the Lewin Barracks. Um, so yeah, we didn't have a home, um, and and over and above that, um, you know, the the team was I think still getting used to establishing itself. Had some good senior players, had a lot of younger players, but the level of professionalism, the level of um, drive and determination and want to succeed, I think, was probably lacking as well. And, and people have acknowledged that, um, you know, sort of 20 or 30 years later. But um, Perth itself and Frio itself, I fell in love with yeah. pretty quickly. It's such a livable city. And um, and uh, whilst I was homesick at times, uh, there's no doubting that, um, yeah, certainly settled pretty quickly. Hmm. Debut comes round five of the 2000 season. Were you nervous ahead of a senior debut? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, I still remember actually sitting in, in Subiac. I was doing some work experience in Hay Street at a marketing firm. Um, I, I got here, talking about those university degrees, I got here and, and got into UWA. Um, and, but I thought, oh, look, the first year I'll just, at that point in time, was I'll do a bit of a, a TAFE apprenticeship throughout the AFL, a bit of marketing kind of work and so I was sitting um we'd, Freo, we'd played Richmond the previous week and won at, at Docklands the old Docklands but Stephen Coops had been reported and he was suspended for two games I thought oh here's my chance to <laughs> to get in I'll, I'll get in on uh, on someone being suspended and um I was it, it's a weird selfish thing at the time but I was hoping that the the decision was going to be that <laughs> I, I would get he would be suspended and I'd get my opportunity. So I was hoping and, and wanting that all week it came. And then, yeah, running out um, at the Wacker back then. That was the – we played two games at the Wacker in my first year. And I got the opportunity to play in the forward pocket alongside Tony Modra, who I idolised growing up as a Crows fan, uh, going to many games as a, as a young kid uh, and young school person at Footy Park or, or Amy Stadium there at uh, in Adelaide. And um, that was a, it was a boyhood dream and um, – I was fortunate the ball landed in my lap in, a, in about 50 seconds and I got to kick a goal early, so that settled the nerves. But, um, yeah, incredible experience. Was that – are you first kick, first goal club? Or Yeah, well, yeah. For, I have the fortune uh, of being um, first two kicks. First two kicks, first two goals. So I don't know how many that exists, but, yeah, just apparently it's on that. <laughs> um, yeah, and then uh, – but I remember – so I was playing on Alistair Nicholson, sort of got a couple of goals early. I think I might have had three shots in the first quarter and we were going okay. Uh, this is a team that hadn't lost a game, Melbourne, and mm. who, went, who ended up um, going on to play in the grand final that, that year. Uh, and then at the end of the first quarter, Neil Danaher, who was coaching uh, Melbourne at the time, um, actually sent David Neitz, who was playing up forward, down on this sort of you know, young 17, uh, 18 year old to stop him um, and he, he certainly did that I did, hardly got a kick <laughs> after Nita came and played on me so it was a nice lesson early on that uh, yeah it's not all beer and skittles in the AFL mm. uh, In your first year you play in a pretty big derby Yeah. how do you, how do you view the West Coast Freo rivalry now? Um, look it the rivalry is real yeah. and it exists and people that say oh, it's just another game um, are just peddling that line out. I mean, I was guilty of doing that um, <laughs> throughout my playing career. It's real. I, I think it kind of had really heated periods and I think it kind of more recently is probably just you know settled a bit. It hasn't been as heated. Um, ma- maybe it was actually, if I think about the one that occurred late last year in 2022, yeah. there was a bit of feeling and heat in that. But I, I f- it felt as though since the... Andrew Gaff Brayshaw it sort of dissipated for a little while and look I think that was the same in in my career early on you know the second game second derby ever played in was the demolition derby which was just like crazy you know spot fires and you know multiple games people (laughs) were suspended for and Guardian I punching on it well he was punching me in the goal square I had no idea what I was doing um like so yeah it was just a um a crazy game. And then I think it kind of dissipated for a little while and then it spiked again, you know, kind of that mid-2000s. Um, yeah, there was a lot going on then. And then it, it probably, you know, it sort of had a lull again. So, But it always – there was always a greater intensity any time um, you played against West Coast. Um, and, yes, it was only worth four points, but – because of you, anywhere you go, you get your coffee, you go to the shops, you go down the park with your dog. People are always talking about it either before or afterwards. So, mm. um, yeah, if you if if we lost, I was you know sending Lauren out to get the groceries. If we won, I was happy to <laughs> charge down and get the coffees. 
All right. Um, we're going to kind of skim along your footy career, but yep. look at a few key moments that are, especially for me, key moments that I want to look at. Sure. First one is round 16, 2005, where you kicked nine goals <laughs> that day. Uh, and, like, it's not a, like you're up against a bad side. Carlton side with players Betts, Favola, Kudafidis, Longmuir, Teague, Wintnell, just to name a couple. What's that day like? How did you manage nine goals that day? Well, so th- this was a poignant moment for us, and, and I say us is because Shane Parker was playing his 200th game, the yeah. first Fremantle player to notch up that milestone. And so that whole week we, we as a team had set it up to honour Shane, um, who was an incredible teammate because he worked his backside off. Um, he didn't want any external plaudits. He was very professional and he was just a great team person um, who had to play on tools and smalls the whole time. Like, you know, Matthew Richardson, six foot six, yeah. to Phil Matera, sort of five foot nothing. So, and, he, and he often did a really – he was sort of the blanket. And so we wanted to honour him. Uh, fortunately, our, our midfield group got on top early. I think I had sort of four or five shots in the first quarter and able to kick a few. Um, and then, yeah, uh, ended up yeah somehow kicking nine. I think it was, was it nine straight or maybe nine one from memory. Might have been and um, but yeah, it was a great day, and it was so good to be able to honour honour Shane. So that was one of those days out where the ball kind of fell in your lap a bit. Looking back on your own career, is a game like that? Does that stick out as a highlight for you? Do you remember it much? I remember parts of it. Um, it's sort of like every now and then, you know, we'll be talking to someone, and they'll say, "I remember, you know, the ten minute mark of the third quarter in two thousand and six <laughs> against Sydney." And you're like, "Yeah, I do." Like you sort of just have this mm. visceral memory of being there, and the sounds, and what you're feeling, and the sweat, and um, it, it is strange how you do recall certain moments of games. Um, and then there's other times where, you know, you'll reel off something and I'll be like, I'm sorry, I can't, <laughs> I can't remember it. So, I mean, I guess over a long career, things stand out. Um, but, yeah, it was nice to, to be on that day for Shane. Mm. 2007 rolls around and you, get, um, you come into the captaincy. How do you go about transitioning into a leadership role? Yeah, look, I reflect on this time. I was 24, I think maybe just yeah, about to turn 25 when it all hap- happened, um, which was which is pretty young, and I, I don't think I – I mean, yes, I was ready, but I wasn't ready. So, you know, we still had – I mentioned Shane Parker, but Troy Cook, Peter Bell, Matthew Carr, Josh Carr, mm. Justin Longmuir, um, Heath Black, you know, so on and so forth. Guys older than me, still Shawnee Mack, um, still playing. Um, and so I think there was this transition for us and for me to realise, well, you know, this is now – Um, my team, our team, the next generation. And so how do you use those older guys to your benefit but at the same time lead? And I think I reflect on that time and and think I was too soft on some people, too hard on others and was trying to be something that I wasn't really my authentic self um, in terms of my my own leadership skills and and traits. So I learned that along the way. Um, But what a great honour to lead an AFL team and um, you know, at that point in time, we'd, we'd been to a prelim in 2006 after winning nine games in a row at the back end of that year and um, had our chances in that prelim against Sydney, but unfortunately mm. went down by sort of four or five goals um, in the end, I think it was. Um, and then, unfortunately, 2007 was just a – I mean, we, we started that game. I still remember round one. Brendan Lade, speaking of moments, Brendan Lade kicking a torp, a 70-metre torp on the – um, city for this down the city end, which sort of broke our hearts in that round one game. And we were, we actually had a good pre season, and that kind of undid us a little bit. We could score really well, we just couldn't defend really well. And that, that was basically the, the tale of 2007. And it was disappointing because I, you know, that period 07 to, to 09, where we were, I guess, rebuilding. Um, was about uh, um, yeah, the prime of my career, effectively. So it was, it was disappointing not to be able to capitalise as a team during that period. But, you know, we, we then went to the draft, got a whole heap of young players, uh, great character, who then, you know, drove our performance um, towards the back end of my career. Hmm. I want to talk about 2013 now, grand final, Freya's first. Uh, lead up to the day, you know, Purple Army descending on Melbourne. What's yeah. that like for you as a player? Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah it really was. Um, you know, to see 10,000 odd people down there on, on the Tuesday um, at Freo Oval sending us off. Um, I, I think that whole week I was wrestling with, you know, embracing everything and, and wanting to just love the fact that it, this was our first crack at it. And when I say us, I mean the fans, the members, the people that have been there from day dot. And then, you know, sort of 
juxtapose that with the fact that I wanted to keep everything as simple and as straightforward as, <laughs> yeah. as we could so we can go and play well. So, And I know that you just can't do that grand final week. Um, but no, look, I, I think we, we handled the week pretty well. The, the problem is we played on a pretty slippery, windy day at the MCG um, and you know we had, our, we had our moments in that game, had our opportunities. Was it eight goals, 14 and five out in the full or whatever it was? I don't think about it all the time, Charlie, yeah. but... Um, Sorry, maybe you it up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe no. I do. But, um, but no, look, I mean, uh, one of those things, great experience, but at the same time, uh, we'd love to have that opportunity again with that, with that group of players. Yeah, and bouncing back after that loss, mm. you know, it was a very hard thing to go through, I imagine. How did you go about coming back? Yeah, so, well, 2013 for me was, you know, our daughter Harper was born in March, which mm. was... The, the best thing ever for, for us and, and you know, she's such a beautiful kid and you, you reflect on on that moment as a, as a father and then, you know, that sort of challenge and, and um, tough result that we had in September about six months later. So we went to um, – uh, I was involved with a group who took us to uh, Hawaii actually at that point in time we were sort of on a conference and Lauren and I spent a bit of time um, by ourselves with Harper. It, was, it, it, did, it took a, a long time to kind of – get over it um but I knew that you know that team still had more in it um and I still had more in me and so you kind of you know go through a very cathartic and emotional process kind of dealing with it you probably bury a fair bit of it down somewhere which I'm probably still dealing with (laughs) in some ways um and then and then you have to get get to work again so um yeah try you know I've always been relatively pragmatic and and moving on quickly um, maybe too quickly, in some instances, has always been a bit of a strength. So compartmentalise, move on, and, and uh, eventually did that uh, with that group of players. Mm. Moving now to 2016. Obviously, 2016 was probably a bit of a letdown year after the minor premiership in yep. 2015, and then a um, bit of a tough season. But you play your last game in round 23, get one goal for the game, and it is your 700th. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the atmosphere that day? I do, yeah. yeah. I, I get sort of um, shivers down the back of my uh, spine about what what that day um, felt like and, and what it meant. So, you know, had everyone here, family, friends, ex-teammates, to sort of send us off and then we're able to you know, go out, run out with our two kids at the time. Lauren was pregnant with our third, uh, Will. Um, but, yeah, to have Jack and Harper with us, run through the banner and then... Um, yeah, we'd, we'd had a really challenging year after, as you said, sort of minor premiers and losing the prelim here to the Hawks in 2015. But that, that day we were on and, and we, we were never mm. going to lose that game. I just I knew for a fact that, you know, the guys were up for the challenge. And um, seeing after the game, I had the fortune of doing the lap or whatever, and I, I could see grown men and women crying. Yeah. And I was sort of a bit bemused by that. Are they? I was like, oh, has something happened or what? You know, and obviously it was it was for me, which, um, yeah, I, 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 it wasn't until then that I'd realised the impact that I guess uh, we'd had together. And I say we had together because I felt like I grew up with the footy club just um, as well as the footy club grew up with me. And so, you know, if we entered about the same stage. You know, we sort of had fits and spurts of form and, and, and yeah, it was... It was a very interesting, weird, out of body experience that last game, but it was it was great to be there. Mm. I was in the I was in the stands that day, and I remember there was a bit of rumblings around. If Pav gets this one goal, we're going to rush the field. <laughs> a bit a bit of kind of like buddy this yeah, year. Yeah, Did you yeah. hear anything about that? I didn't. Um, no, I didn't. <laughs> I, um, that would have been interesting. Yeah, would have, yeah. Obviously, didn't happen though. Didn't happen in okay. the end. No. Uh, now, you transition out of footy. Was there any difficulty there? Because it can be an interesting process. Oh, yeah. Um, look, for me, I was – because I went to university, got mm. the two degrees out of the way pretty much by the time I'd finished uh, and I'd you know, invested and become um, interested in a couple of business opportunities and I had sort of the media around the place. I felt as though I was going to be okay yeah. and that's been the case. Um, but the transition's still tricky, like – you know, <laughs> you go from being quite selfish, you go from quite being very focused on training and diet and everything to, well, you can do whatever you want now. And yeah. so, you know, finding discipline and routine. And and the biggest thing for me that I learned was for 17, probably for 20 years, I exercised, exercised pretty much every day. Yeah. And 
I got paid to do that, which was like the best job in the world. Let's let's put that out there. But when I stopped and I wasn't forced to exercise or go and run or whatever it was, I was like, yeah, I could. F- the mental benefits of actually exercising, it was so obvious when I stopped doing it um, after doing it for such a period of time. So that routine and discipline of getting up and working out, like going for a run, going for a walk, doing some weights, you know, running around with the kids, like I, I worked out the, how important that was. Um, and then just the the general kind of change of pace, like it's not all about you anymore. It's not all about high performance anymore. And then just finding what your day looks like. Um, that's an ongoing evolution and transition that, you know, six years later I'm still working through. But again, fortunate to kind of have enough um, credentials or, or opportunities behind me that I could sort of start to make some choices about what that looked like. Mm. Kind of looking back on your whole footy career, you played in just about every position there was. Mm. How, did, how did you describe yourself as a footy player? If somebody asked you, what position did you play? What would you say? <laughs> um, yeah, utility probably doesn't do it. I, mm. I don't know. Um, look, I, I think I was a key forward yeah. who was able to play in other positions, yeah. which is a bit of a convoluted answer. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the majority of my career I played as a key forward, but I did obviously have spent lots of time in the midfield and also um, a couple of seasons down back. So, and look... People often ask, like, oh, you know, how do I get um, little Johnny or, you know, or what do I – I'm an aspiring young player, should I focus on? My advice is play lots of different sports. Yep. Play lots of different positions. And the reason why I say that is two, twofold. One, if you're playing lots of different sports, soccer, hockey, tennis, football, cricket, you get spatial awareness and learnings about how players move and how you attack and defend as a team. Um Playing in different positions, you have empathy for what happens up the field, both in the midfield and defence in, in the game that I played for a long time. And you just get such a better education of what the game is and how it works. So when you do finally settle in a position like I did as a key forward in the back half of my career, um, you have all those learnings with you. So, yeah, that's my advice. Play lots of sports, um, you know, study because that it stimulates your brain as well and also um, – play lots of different positions. Mm. I've got a list in front of me of just about all of your achievements as you played footy. <laughs> Does one stand out to you? Because there's Doig medals, there's a captaincy, there's honours, there's, uh, there's, you know, I could go on. Does, is there one that's special for you? Uh, probably the the Hall of Fame yeah. that came this year. Um, I guess when, unfortunately, you don't uh, have the ultimate team success like we did as a group, which still burns, um, yeah, to be to be recognised as you know, I think there's a couple hundred people in the the Hall of Fame. Um, mm. Yeah, the kid that ran around his backyard with a ball in his hands never thought that that was possible. Yeah. Um, I thought that potentially one day I might get into the AFL, but to think I played for 17 years and are recognised alongside some of the players and people that I long admired. Um, yeah, it's um, it, it really is a, a, a nice dream come true. Mm. So post-footy, you, of course, move into the media as kind of a, a big role. Was media <coughs> always the plan for you? No, it wasn't. I, um, I probably thought I'd be more involved in corporate world having done kind of my two university degrees. Yeah. Um, but I guess what I when I retired, it was like I don't want to just go in straight into a – um, nine to five, typical kind of job. I want some time to just, you know, uh, decompress and yeah. work out what I want to do. And having a couple of business interests plus the media there was a great sort of transition for me. So I could spend, you know, um, whatever a normal work day is, nine to a certain amount, um, doing those business interests. And then I could go and do my media roles. So, um, I think there comes a point and a time which I'm still thinking about now about when I'm going to have to sort of make a an adult decision and uh, settle in in on one thing if I if I have to. But um, it's been a, it's been a really nice way of transitioning out of the game mm. and developing yourself as a media yeah. presenter. How did that come about? Yeah, well, I still feel like I'm I'm developing and, and working through that. Um, yeah, you just it's it's such a different when you're on 
on the other side of asking questions um, and just always answering, you know, that sort of comes quite naturally after doing it for so long. So you do have to develop your own style, your own feeling towards it and just get comfortable being in front of the camera or presenting or talking. Um, that just takes time. Uh, and I'm, I'm probably still working my way through that <laughs> in some ways. Um, but I enjoy it. And uh, it gives you, like, you know, you can producing, like, you know, you guys are here, um, asking the questions like you are, getting the best out of the person that you're interviewing and then just, you know, there's elements of the of the news that are really tight and really precise so you kind of have to nail that and, um, yeah, it's a, it's tricky. It's not as easy as um, the people um, that I've worked with for a long time. If I think about Anthony Hudson or um, Jason Dunstall or Michael Thompson or mm. some of these people that have done it for years and years uh, make it a lot easy but there's a lot of preparation and a lot of hard work that goes in. Mm. Won't keep you for too much longer. Just a couple more questions. Just reflecting on that whole kind of process. Is there anything that you would change along the way? Outside of winning a premiership? Um, <laughs> yeah, that one. Uh, what would I change? No, I, look, I mean, no. I Look, there's things that happen in your life, this is for everyone, where you go, well, I would have liked a better outcome on that. Mm. But, yeah, I'm certainly not one to think about glass half empty or you know, consider regret for decisions you make. You make a decision, you give it all you can and you move on. Um, and what, I, what I'm proud of is, is that, and I'm still doing it now, is that you put yourself out there for ridicule, for um, analysis, for critique on a daily basis and you get, you get that certainly in a high-performance environment like the AFL. And doing that in media and doing that in business, you're, you're exposing yourself to hurt and to uh, risk and to uncertainty. And so, but I'd much rather, and this is where the man in the arena quote comes in, which is a, a great quote, obviously. I'd much rather be one of those people having a crack, having a go and putting myself out there and risking it all as compared to one of those timid souls just, you know, potting people. So, um doesn't mean I always get it right yeah. and doesn't mean there's not lots of hurt and failure in that because there is. But um, I'd rather be known as someone that, you know, had a swing rather than uh, putting, putting the golf club away. Very fair. Final question, bit of a hypothetical. 15-year-old Pav is sitting in front of you. What advice <laughs> are you giving him? Um, don't eat Subway or Maccas. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I only say that because, you know, most – 15-year-olds are nailing uh, some sort of fast food or takeaway. And I remember when I got into the AFL, even the SNFL system, I was like, geez, I better not start. I should eat, eat a bit better. Um, what, what advice? Um, yeah, follow, follow your passions, follow your dreams, but understand what you're willing to endure. And what I mean by that is it's all well and good to follow your passion but also understand what that passion, like what are the what are the tough things that w follow with that p profession, f with that um, passion. So, are you willing to put up with all that critique and, and and challenge and controversy and up and down and all those things, the roller coaster that was AFL and that still can be the life? Or are you just more content to you know have a maybe a bit more of a simpler life, um, mm. perhaps? But the, the outcome may not be. As, so you just got to – what do you – follow your passion, but what can you endure? What, what can you put up with? Because um, I don't think at 15 I ever thought about that. It was like, no, I just want to do this and come on, let's get moving and I'm really aspirational, let's have a crack and, yeah. Because um, there are some, some tough things that come with um, putting yourself out there. Incredible. That is How Did I Get Here for today. You can find us student underscore edge on Instagram, student edge on TikTok. Find us at studentedge.org for all our articles, co podcasts, competition, deals, career advice, education tips, and much, much more, Matt. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Thank you.